This is a disclosure. Please note that all guests featured on the AdTech God Pod are invited to participate. They do not pay in any form to appear on the show. However, guests may be sponsors of the AdTech God community, the AdTech Forum, or other product offerings. This is AdTech God, and this is a commercial message. Inavid believes that TV should be open for everyone and controlled by no one. And the time to make that vision a reality is now. That's why Inavid created Harmony, an industry-wide initiative to address the biggest challenges facing CTV advertising today. By optimizing at the infrastructure level, Harmony aims to improve efficiency, enhance transparency and control, and increase ROI, all while reducing carbon emissions and providing better viewing experiences for all. Find out more and get involved at Innovid.com slash Harmony. Again, go to Innovid.com slash Harmony. Welcome to the AdTech God Pod, your window into the world of advertising technology and the people behind it. I'm your host, AdTech God. Welcome back to another episode of the AdTech God Pod, the podcast where we meet the brilliant minds shaping AdTech's future. I'm your host, AdTech God, and today we have a special guest whose journey in AdTech has been remarkable. Lauren Fisher currently serves as the General Manager of Business Intelligence at Advertiser Perceptions, a prestigious role where she leads efforts to decode the complexities of the AdTech ecosystem, providing actionable intelligence that helps companies navigate market dynamics. Her work at Advertiser Perceptions is not just about data, it's about crafting stories that resonate, guiding strategic decisions that shape the industry. Lauren spent over nine years at eMarketer prior to this role, and her keen analysis and forward-thinking insights have made her a go-to expert for understanding the digital advertising landscape's current trends and future direction. I've heard Lauren speak before, so I'm really excited for this episode and to meet her one-on-one. Lauren, welcome to the AdTech God Pod. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Lauren, you obviously are an industry expert. You you were highly recommended to me by multiple people. I've heard you speaking at at multiple vendors. I've seen your work. How did you get into this industry and and why ad tech? Yeah, no, it's a an interesting question. Uh, I think everyone's journey into ad tech is slightly different, and I think a lot of people like myself sort of stumble into the industry by accident. I uh, had just wrapped up a graduate program at Ohio State, and I was looking for a job in California at the time. I wasn't living there yet, but was throwing my resume out to a lot of different places. And I ended up getting a call from a company called business.com, and they were looking for an online advertising editor. So I had a journalism background. Writing and editing were definitely a skill set. And so I started at business.com editing 200 character search ads. It was definitely very different working for a search engine. And I had to learn the business relatively quickly. At the time, we were a startup. So it was exciting to be part of that startup culture and mentality. In my time there, uh, I was there for five years. I moved around which again, I really love about the startup culture is the ability to grow and shift within the organization. I started as an editor for online ads. I moved into an account management role serving the Northwest part of the US. From there, I moved actually into a product role on the engineering team, working on our self-serve interface for clients. And then when my husband and I decided to move back East, I ended up taking a marketing role with the company and continuing that from our office in Connecticut. So it was a really sort of by accident experience that I had, but it was for me really exciting to be able to have an opportunity to be exposed to so many different aspects of the business and really start to understand the industry from all of those different vantage points. Editing 200 characters on search ads doesn't sound like fun to me. I guess you could argue it's a game, right? It's a challenge to be able to make something sound exciting and articulate. And in under 200 characters. What a great way to kind of get into the industry. I think one of the key focuses I I try to talk about with with guests is, you know, it's the foundational stuff that you learn. That particular role sets you up for, you know, moving into the account management role and then moving into product. 
and then obviously moving into a marketing role with the same company. How did you get in those roles? How did you even put your name in the hat for those particular roles? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm not entirely sure, right? I wish I had a really clear answer for you. I would say that a lot of it probably came down to visibility within the organization. I asked a lot of questions. I interacted with a lot of different people in different departments. And so over time, I think those conversations and that general curiosity that I had naturally led me to have more and more conversations with people about those specific roles. And after you you moved into the marketing role, what was next in your career in terms of your, your progression forward? So I was in the marketing role for a couple of years working with our strategic sales team specifically focused on our agency clients. And in those two years, I went back to a lot of content creation. That was my background to begin with, right? Working on newsletters, working on a lot of our marketing copy, some of our event strategy as well. But around the end of 2010, 20, I think it was 2010, our company decided to shutter our sales and marketing divisions. We had been acquired by another firm. And over time, they decided that they were going to go in a different direction. So I was laid off sometime probably right before 2011 started, and I had to find a new role. So my next step was looking around, trying to understand what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go. Of all the things that happened, I was actually on LinkedIn doing a job search and clicked on a banner ad for a position that was open at eMarketer. I had been familiar with eMarketer because we were a client. I actually used a lot of their research for our sales organization, for putting together some of our pitch decks and our newsletters. And so I was familiar with the brand. I ended up getting a call from eMarketer and then ended up getting a a job with them. can't believe it. You're like that 0.05% click-through rate. It's insane, right? I mean, it's kind of funny that that's how it ended up happening, but that is legitimately how it ended up happening. It's like an anomaly over here. I know. You're obviously like really, really dedicated to your employers, by the way, because most people don't spend four years and then, you know, nine years at at eMarketer. And so you obviously have changed. I'm, I'm seeing like 2020 and moved over to advertiser perceptions. What is it that you do at advertiser perceptions today as the general manager? And how does that? Differ. So, a lot of what I do today is exactly what you described. I'm working with the research and insights that we conduct on behalf of our clients and also ourselves for the topics that we know are important for the advertising industry. And then I take all of that intelligence and package it in a way that's meaningful for our clients and the industry at large. I work with a team of seven people total, including myself, who are business intelligence analysts. It's, you know, some of the smartest people I've ever worked with. And we're all from different backgrounds within the advertising and marketing ecosystem. So it's really wonderful to just continue to have this group of experts that you can go to when you're working on a topic that might be slightly new or you're working on a particular type of project or study that you haven't done before, it's really great to have those people to lean on and their expertise. And I also really love that everyone has such a different work experience that they bring to the table. So you learn a lot just from everyone's background and where they've come from. You talked about you know your time at business.com, eMarketer, and now Advertiser Perceptions. You've been there for a little over four years. What do you feel was was your greatest milestone thing that you're most proud of in your career? It's such a hard question. I feel like I'm proud of so many things. And I feel like everything's constantly moving, if that makes sense. I don't know that there's ever time, especially in our space, right, to sort of take a pause and be like, wow, you know, that that was it. That was the big thing. And then you're moving on to the next thing. I would say the exception to that, right, would be some of the people who have gone through 
an IPO or things like that, right? That's a, that's a big accomplishment. But I think for me, you know, it's constant. When I say it's constantly changing, I mean that, you know, in a good way. You're constantly working on new challenges. For me, I'm working on new projects, learning about new areas of the industry, writing new reports, pieces of content. So I wouldn't say that, you know, I can point to anything specifically and be like, that's a pivotal moment for me. I think it's a lot of little moments that lead to sort of where you are overall. It's a great perspective. I agree. I think some people have, you know, major milestones, right? But those milestones are, like you said, I went public, we were required. Others, I think, are very similar to you, right? It's, you know, I'm proud of a lot of things I do every year. I'm proud of a lot of things I do at my current companies. All of it compounded is, is incredible, but each individual piece played a role in the next. So I love that you put it that way. I think that's the reality for a lot of people. And I think sometimes we're conditioned to not think of it that way, right? We have to have that big story. We have to have that big goal. And I think it's okay for people to just constantly be moving and, and truthfully, you know, be satisfied regardless of where they are. I think society makes it hard for you to be satisfied where you are. I love that you say that because I think that what's happened, especially in the last 10 years or so, is what you see online and through social media is always really positive. Just bought a bigger house, just bought a bigger car, just got a promotion. But what you don't see and what you don't hear are the true struggles that people are having. And so I think when you take a look at everybody's career path and just their lives in general, there's a lot of ups and downs. And I think just respecting the fact that, hey, you know what? This is a phase I'm going through. It's not always going to be good. It's not always going to be bad to embrace it and just kind of recognize the blessings that you have in the moment, I think is super important. I agree 100%. And I think... It's about your career, but it's also about all the other things that are happening in your life. And you know, it changes over time. You're crushing it at work, but your personal life is a mess or things at work are frustrating, but you have a great work-life balance, right? I mean, you asked me why I stay at companies so long. Part of it is just that I get there. And if you know all of the good days outweigh the bad, then I'm happy and I want to stay. If I like who I'm working with, if I feel challenged, if I'm learning things, then it's a good thing. It's a good place to be. I also love the fact that you moved around a lot, meaning you wore multiple hats. I think that's very refreshing. I know myself, I've done that a couple of times at the same employer and it really is a fresh start, but you have the foundational understanding of the company's structure or processes. And so it kind of gives you a leg up on the competition. And I prefer that type of movement personally than leaving an employer and starting from scratch and not knowing who to go to for what. And I think it's a great way for people in the market who may not be totally satisfied with their roles or what they're doing today to kind of switch it up a little bit and, and get a fresh perspective on, on the company. Agreed. And I, you know, I really like learning all the different pieces of the business. I think you have a lot of respect for the company you work at when you see it from multiple points of view. I think also just from a relationship perspective with your colleagues, right? Once you have that different point of view, you can really look back and then your relationships with people that were in the role you're in or the part of the business you were in are so much better because you know where they're coming from. I agree. So Lauren, as you, you mentioned all the change and nothing really stays the same in the industry. I'm curious, there's, there's obviously a ton of change happening across the space today. What's your opinion on where things are heading over the next you know, 12 to 18 months? What do you think is going to be a popular topic or change to our industry? Yeah. What I like about our industry and I think what's kept me here so long is everything changes, right? Sometimes it's so fast that your head is spinning and you're kind of feeling like you're playing catch up. But when I look at the next 12 to 18 months, I think that we're really going to be focusing a lot on identity. We've been focusing on identity broadly the last several years, whether that's in 2018 with GDPR coming, with IDFA and Google, and many of the steps along the way to the deprecation of third-party cookies in Chrome. It's been really important for the industry to talk about. It's 
all of these have been important for the industry to prepare for. But I think the next 12 to 18 months are going to be critical for how the industry moves forward from a digital perspective. And I think we're going to see a lot of innovation. And I'm hopeful that we'll also see a lot of resetting on the buy and sell side with what measures of success actually look like. And, you know, we can take some of those steps back to really redefine the metrics that matter, which, you know, we don't always do. You know, I think there's a general feeling in the industry, a little bit of panic about the, you know, cookie deprecation, how that's going to impact, you know, both media buying and media selling. Obviously, there's a huge reliance on on first party cookies, you know, understanding how to package, sell or buy based off contextual there's God, there's ID solutions in market. Nobody knows which one to use. So it, it just seems like it's a little bit all over the map, but, but generally like we've known this for quite some time. I think a lot of the industry was, was a little bit of in denial. And just the other day I had mentioned, and this was a sarcastic post, but I, I like to hear people's, you know, perception of it. And I wrote that, you know, Google single handedly saved ad tech by deprecating the cookie. And some people were like, no, you're nuts. This is killing the market. Other people are like, no, you're, you're kind of right. Like we are being forced to adapt and change and innovate in a industry that may not have seen much innovation as it relates to that particular topic over the years. And so I'm, I'm really sort of bullish on the topic that, you know, over the next 12, 18, 24 months, like we are going to see an improvement in how we monetize and how we sell our inventory and market. I just think everyone is scared to figure out how it's going to end up. Yeah, it's a lot, right? There's a lot of unknowns that can be really stressful. We're in ad tech though. We're designed to be nimble. We're designed to figure it out and we will, right? I know we don't always get there right away. When GDPR first rolled out, there were still a lot of people who hadn't done a lot. And that may be true here, right? But Pretty soon, people will figure it out. You already have a lot of people taking advantage of every single type of alternative that you already mentioned, right? And we continue to see that they're using all of them. Those plus whatever new things that will come, I think we're just going to continue to see the industry evolve. And I think evolve for the better. Do I have a weird too positive perception on this? Because I feel like, okay, good. It's going to hurt a little, ripping off the Band-Aid. It's going to suck for a bit, but when we figure it out, it's going to be better. And I think some people think I'm a little nuts, but I think others are like, no, you're right. It's going to be tough in the beginning, but it's going to fix what we need to fix. So what would you say we need to fix? Well, I I think with, with the deprecation of the cookie, I think it's a methodology that we've been using for so long that the entire industry has sort of been built on. So it's like, depending on a combustion engine to run your car, when in reality, there's an alternative method to create motion for your vehicle. And that innovation is honestly what sparks more innovation. And everything seems to have been based around a cookie. And so by creating improved, you know, ID solution, if we create improved contextual solutions, if we embrace AI in order to understand what it is, the content that we're serving our ads next to, or to modify our ad creative, all of this together really does create pretty impressive offering and market, but we wouldn't have been forced to do it if the cookies weren't going away. And so in my opinion, the IDs, the contextual, the utilization of AI, that combination to me personally, I think is going to spark like a boom in our industry once it's fixed or refined. Let me say that. Yeah. I mean, from the innovation perspective, I agree. I I think that there's a lot of promise there. I'm also really hopeful that, like I said, from a metrics perspective, it gives organizations the ability to really rethink what success looks like for them and to rewrite those benchmarks and those bonuses even so that they are prioritizing some of the partners that matter, the practices that matter, and they're not just relying on things that they've relied on because they're afraid of not meeting their quotas or they're afraid of not getting their bonus, right? 
I would hope as well that with the innovation comes more of a awareness of the consumer aspect as well, and that it does really lead us toward what the intention of all of this should be, which is a better consumer experience, but also from a privacy perspective, right? You're absolutely right. And I think privacy is something that I don't touch up on at all. How do you see that in particular improving with the deprecation of the cookie and using other methods? I mean, what what are you speaking to with clients in terms of how that benefits their users? Well, part of it has to be just the awareness factor, right? I think with the deprecation of third-party cookies, with the necessity of having to take alternative approaches that should and hopefully is sparking conversations internally about what privacy-centric practices should look like. We can't rely on third-party cookies anymore. We want to double down on first-party data. Well, what does that mean for our consumers? What does that mean for our clients? How are we going to do that in a way that benefits them as well as us. Thinking about things like contextual, right? How can we take advantage of that, but also still make sure that we're abiding to some of the privacy practices? Obviously, contextual is designed to be more privacy-friendly in certain setups, given that you wouldn't be relying on necessarily PII. But by the same token, you know, it's a dance between having that positive or what we would consider a productive consumer experience, but also maintaining that privacy aspect where consumers aren't feeling like, you know, there's too much information that companies know about them. And it's important for them to feel that way. I think many times where I sit in the world of ad tech, I don't think about that as much because my particular role doesn't touch that very much. But you're right. Being respective of consumers' privacy is important. Understanding how it's collected and utilized for more relevant ads is, is obviously a topic that we should all be aware of. And, and hopefully this resolves for that and, and improves things for the user. Lauren, as, as we're kind of moving into you know the second quarter of the year, where do you see yourself learning the most and adapting the most? Where do you find the, the resources you need to keep yourself up to date on all these constantly changing industry topics? So I'm really fortunate that I work day to day with our clients and I feel like they are the primary source of information for me. Every day I'm having conversations about things that are challenging for media companies, things that media companies are wondering whether they should double down on or move away from. Those types of conversations for me are really invaluable to understand the way that the market's moving because they're thinking about them, right? And so that's sort of the the front lines of information that I get to see. And I feel very lucky to be in that position. Also, you know, it's talking with colleagues, talking with acquaintances, having conversations just like this, right? And learning from one another through a one-to-one interaction. I read the trades. I read the you know newsletters and all that stuff. We'll talk about it as a team quite often. We like to have team conversations about what's important, what's changing. But it's for me more of the conversation that I really get a lot of information from or prefer to, I should say, than necessarily sitting down and, and reading every morning. I'm not a big reader. I think that's the first thing I need to confess. Not a big reader. I definitely prefer conversations also. For me, I, I would much rather hop on a phone call with, with someone such as yourself and chat for 30 minutes. I feel like I learn 10 times more than reading an article. I'm your typical demographic of scan through 400 words max, get the general understanding of it and move on. But conversations, I can, I can chat you up for four hours. I might have no problem sitting on a phone call for, for hours talking about a topic. So I love that you get your, your insights from your clients, from your partners, from your industry friends. I think that's a great source to be really up to date before it hits the news. Lauren, 
This brings us to the end of the podcast. And I, I wanted to thank you for taking time out of your, your busy day to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed our conversation. Same here. Thank you so much, Lauren. And I will definitely speak to you soon. Sounds good. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Ad Tech God Pod, a podcast for the people about the people that make Ad Tech great. Stay connected with me for more insights, trends, and interviews in the realm of Ad Tech. Don't miss out on our latest updates. So follow me on X, Instagram, and connect with me on LinkedIn. Don't forget, ATG Slack community has insights, networking opportunities, and jobs. Keep the conversation going and stay at the forefront of ad tech innovation.